Hello, um, we're going to talk about Git today. This is an Octocat. Um, John, who helped me prepare this presentation because I had to do all the tax, uh, <laughs> put lots of pictures of Octocat in this presentation. This is GitHub's logo. It's a really cool logo. So just some important details there. Um, <laughs> Git, Git and GitHub are really awesome. Um, I really, really love them, which is why I'm here to talk about them. Uh, this is also my favorite meme ever, <laughs> the Ermagerd one. Um, but this is the only one in the presentation, so it's okay. From Secret Lab, I'm sure everyone knows that. Um, Secret Lab is fantastic. You should give us money, etc. Thank you. Um, Git. How many people are actually using Git now? Good. That's great. Uh, how many people want to use Git? Yep. How many people are using Subversion or CVS or something horrible like that? Yep. Cool. Anyone using like Mercurial or Perforce or? Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Um, Git is a, a, a thing that you need to install on most of your computers. I'm not going to talk about how to set it up. It's boring. You shouldn't be here if you can't set up Git. Just Google it. If you're running a Mac, you can just install the developer tools in Xcode, the, the command line tools thing, and you'll have Git. Um, if you're not running a Mac, I don't really know how you do it. <laughs> you may not be able to do it. I don't really know. Um, I really want you to be able to understand how Git works. So while this might be an introduction to Git, uh, I'm hoping you get an understanding of what is going on underneath so you can solve problems yourself when they inevitably occur. Because you will break something when you use Git. Or you'll erase your entire repo. Or at least think you did. Um, you don't need to do anything. Just follow along and, and ask questions at the end. Or don't. Whatever. It's good. It's the last, last presentation of possibly the last conference. Who knows? I'm going out on a negative. That's how I, that's how I roll. Um, so Git is a version control system. Uh, it can be used with source code primarily, although you can pretty much use it with anything else you want to use it for. You could put art into it if you really wanted to put art files into it. It was developed by this guy. Hope many of you recognize him. He has dark, piercing eyes. Um, this is Linus Torvalds, the developer of Linux kernel, for those of you who aren't nerds. Um, you can get hosted Git in many, many places. I'm sure you've heard of many of these things or perhaps even used them for some other code hosting. Do you know GitHub hosts SVN as well? It's a little known secret. I'm not going to talk about that, though. It's just interesting. Git is a distributed version control system, which kind of differs from stuff like SVN and CVS in that it's, well, distributed. Um, when you have a version control system, you've got a bunch of files in it, um, and you add more files over time, and that's great. Uh, what happens when you lose your files, though? Well, lots of things happen, but primarily that happens. Files just go away. They burn. Um, another case, maybe you've got a project, and you make some changes to files. <laughs> lots of changes. You later realize they suck, and you want to undo them. In traditional version control, well, you pull it down and you copy, and you fixed your files. That's great. Commit changes to the repository as you go. Stuff happens. You commit it. It's done. It's in the repo. Set those changes to the server. Nearly there. OK. Sorry, my phone's lagging. Um, if another user has access to the repository, they can check out whatever's in there and make their own changes and push them back up. And this can also be committed. And then you can work independently. That's great. But distributed version control is a lot better. So in distributed version control, which is what Git is, uh, each person has their own repository. And they push their change into that repository. And this is local to their machine. And when uh, you can then push and pull changes between other repositories. And there's no built-in copy of a concept of a master copy. So basically, everyone's working with an individual repository. Uh, and you can move files between them. Each team member basically has a repo of their own. And there's an origin repo on the server. Whoops. And there's an origin repo on the server. Uh, as you work, you commit changes to your repo, and then later on push it to the server. But everyone at every moment has a full copy of the entire history of the project. It's really useful. Let's go the other way. Let's go on a Git adventure. This is one of the many Octocats. There's heaps of them. If you want to look at them all, there's Octodex. Just Google that. It's great. And they went a bit nuts. Um, to create a Git repo, you run a command line. Git init. It's great. Basically, you change into the directory of the project. You want to make a version controlled and run git init. This is a dev world project. 
got a readme file in it. Okay, it's git init. So I've gone git init, now I've got a .git folder. It's hidden. That folder contains basically everything. It doesn't really matter much what's in there, but it's the entire repo. It's hidden, you don't need to mess with it. Don't touch it, please don't touch it. Um, you can remove that folder as well if you want to make something not version control anymore. And it's gone. So it's not like subversion where there's crap cluttered throughout the entire project, which is great. You can make changes to files when you're in a git repo. Um, so git add and git commit. But basically, when you're ready to commit, you stage the files and commit the stage changes. Now, we'll go through this in detail in a moment, but it's pretty simple. So here we're going to add a new file. There's the file. We want to commit this change. Talk about it in a second. Git status is basically the way you figure out what you're doing all the time in your repo. So every time you do something, you should check the status of your repo to make sure you haven't messed it up irreparably. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Tony. Yeah, you are. No, you're not. No. Anyway, use git status to check on the status of your repository and make sure you know what's going on. Uh, so, as I said, git status here is telling me that uh, readme and main are not tracked. So you can see up here, untracked files, readme and main. This means that git doesn't actually know anything about them and they're just sitting in the directory. So I need to actually add these files to git. Git add is the way to do this, as I said a moment ago. In this case, I'm just going to add everything. So git add star, which is everything in the directory. So I've added these files. It's going to not say anything at all. Distractions, Tim. I didn't say Louis. Louis. The naughty corner. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so git will not complain if you do something right. So I've added these files. It's basically said, that's fine, that's great. I'm not going to tell you anymore because you know what you're doing. Um, if you try to add something that doesn't exist, it will complain. But git status now. You can see that the files are now staged for the next commit. So it's telling me files to be committed, readme and main. It's pretty simple. Git status is your friend. Use it a lot because otherwise you'll get confused as to what's going on. Git commit records anything that's staged to the actual repository. So once you've added something, you actually need to commit it to save it into your local repo. I've committed. I'm going to make first commit. It's a commit message. It's pretty straightforward. Git will tell me what it's done here. Two change files. Pretty simple. Good. And git status reports there's nothing really happening, as it should. So again, use git status all the time to make sure you know what you're doing. You can commit a specific object as well, if you want to just do something like that. You can commit all the change files. Um, but bear in mind, this does not commit new files if they haven't been added. So git add. These are not going to go up to the repo. Um, pretty simple. Git move and git rm let you rename and delete things. So if you feel that you need to move something around in your repo, you have to do it by git rm or git mv. You should never just delete something. Um, if you do that, git's going to get confused. If you use the finder or just delete from the terminal without using the git version of the command, git's just going to chuck a fit and not know what's going on. So please don't do that. That's a really good way to mess your repository up very quickly. To rename a file, you just move it. Sorry, pretty much standard Unix stuff. Uh, git move is for renaming. So renamed it here. It's done. And then, as you can see, git status tells me there's a rename that hasn't been committed yet. So again, I need to commit the change if I rename something. Removing a file is pretty similar. So in the case we git removing the readme file, it's gone. And there's a rename and a delete to commit now. It's pretty simple stuff. It's pretty much akin to what you might be used to in an old-fashioned version control system. But nothing is happening on the server here. So you're all local for all these commands. Uh, when you're doing a lot of work, you often want to see what you've changed. This is a great Octocat. <laughs> Hope everyone recognizes it. Fantastic. If you don't recognize it, please leave. Um, <laughs> so we've got some files here with a fairly small change in them. Which makes it infinitely more sophisticated. Um, Git diff will show you the difference between the index, so the stage, the thing you've added to, as well as the working directory, so the stuff you're actually working on. So text that's been removed has a negative at the start. Text that's been added has a positive at the start. So if we run git diff, it's showing me there's a difference. 
between what's been staged and what I've done in the directory. And the difference is we've removed something and added another. And you can see there. Pretty simple. Everyone should know the diff syntax. Many text editors understand it. Xcode will read this for you properly. Diff normally only staged shows unstaged commits. Uh, when I git add the changed file and then get a diff. So I've git added the, the thing I've changed and then got a diff. There's nothing different to look at. It's pretty simple. You want to show changes that will be added to the next commit. You can use git diff staged. That's pretty useful. We can see what changes will be recorded when we next commit. So basically, you're going to see here what's actually changing when I push a commit next time. Unstaging is a pretty powerful concept in Git. Uh, you often make a mistake. Sometimes you'll stage a file, so you know, add it and commit it when you don't really mean to. This is what Git reset is for. I've staged this file, so I've got something I haven't committed yet, a main program.c, but I didn't actually really want it to be staged. I use git reset, so git reset, it's remove the change. So it's not changed my working directory, it's just changed what I've saved into the staging area. So I can keep editing and then stage it again to fix whatever stupid mistake I made. You can also uh, accidentally commit changes and then realize you shouldn't have committed them. Maybe there's a typo in the commit message, it's pretty common. Uh, you can do that by doing a reset soft. It's pretty simple. Now, with old version control systems like Subversion, you might be used to commits being referred to by a number, uh, like sequentially, starting at one usually. And you often uh, rely on these numbers to identify which part of the repo you're talking to. Git has some aliases for a common bunch of versions of your repo. There's head, which is the most recent version, and there's head caret, which is the second most recent version, and there's head tilde three, which is three revisions ago. And these are easy shortcuts to refer to your repo. Um, git refers to commits with an ID number, which is actually a SHA-1 hash of the changes. So it's not like a single digit number, it's actually a, a long, confusing looking thing. But it's easy to refer to things like this. So most recent revision, most recent revision, two ago and so on, than it is to refer to actual version numbers. So when I add the soft parameter to git reset, it adds, uh, it resets my working copy to the revision I specify. Um, but it does not discard any changes I've made since that revision. So it means I can commit again if I want to put those changes back. So here I'm git reset soft to the most previous recent version other than the head. It's pretty simple. Tony's back. <sighs> anyway, so as you can see, we've gone back to the previous revision, uh, but main program.c is marked as changed, and it's ready to be committed again. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, you can go reset hard if you really want to wipe the slate clean and remove all the changes since the revision. Pretty straightforward. This will actually lose data. So git reset hard basically means make my copy, working copy be whatever revision I've specified and drop any changes since that revision. So it will actually nuke whatever it is you're telling it to nuke. Completely gone. Unless you're time machining or something fancy like that. So we've made a change to our repository. We've got a main program.c to be committed and we want to wipe the slate clean. We reset hard. Git tells us that uh, we're at a certain revision, and we're done. Git assumes that if you took the effort to write dash dash hard, it won't prompt you again. So it doesn't think you're stupid. If you've ever read anything written or seen any interviews with Linus Torvalds, he's an opinionated bastard. <laughs> Git behaves the same way. Um, it's pretty straightforward. He is a Git. He is a Git, yeah. <laughs> but he, he's pretty awesome, because this is good. We can confirm that our change is gone with git reset. So, um, uh, gone with git reset, nothing to commit, there's no changes in the history. So, we could do status once we're after, after we've reset. It's, it's worked. Um, if you didn't keep a copy around, you can't get it back at this point. So far, we've basically talked about stuff that's entirely on the local machine you're working on. Uh, nothing to do with the server at all at this point. So, we're going to talk about remotes now. Uh, remotes are the way of working with a server, and it's pretty powerful. A remote is really quite simply a repository that's hosted on another computer somewhere. Uh, you generally only deal with one remote, but you can deal with as many as you like. Uh, the default is called the origin, so the origin remote. But you can have as many as you like. You'll need to host your repo somewhere to have a remote. 
We use GitHub. It's really powerful. It's great, but it'll work with anything. GitHub has free public accounts, which will give you repos that store public open source code. And you can pay to get stuff to host private repos. It's really powerful. So I'm going to assume you've got a repo somewhere, or we'll have a repo somewhere. We've got a repo on GitHub. Thanks again to John for the screenshots. I didn't have time. That's my John's username, not mine. GitHub's built a repo here, and it's got a readme file in it. Not much more. Pretty straightforward. You don't need to worry about this. This is just an empty repo. But you can see there's a, a URL that belongs to the repo. It's a .git file. So when you create a local repository based on one remotely, it's called cloning. It's basically cloning the repo down, and you get all the history as well. It's important but to remember. Uh, other people could clone your copy of the repository as well if they wanted to. So your copy and the one that's on the server are equals. It's exactly the same thing. Got to remember that. To clone the repository, you git clone and provide the URL here. So literally just git clone and then a git URL. Git URLs usually end in .git, although they don't actually have to. And the repository will be cloned. So I've got a new folder now. It's done. You can just change into the directory and have a look what's going on. It's pretty simple. In this case, we've got nothing to go on because it's a clean working directory. We've checked it out. We've made no changes. Branches are something that often really scares people when it comes to version control systems. They're not scary at all. Um, you often have an idea and you want to try it out or you want to keep bug fixing one part of the project while you make a new feature for another part. Branches are a great way of doing that. They don't interfere with each other. I've got my project. I'm doing a bunch of commits. At any point, I can create a new branch and add commits to that and keep working in the other branch as well. This main branch is called master. It's called master in most version control systems. So our master is here and our branch is over here. I can work on them independently. I can merge branches together once I'm done working on them independently and I want to push them all back into the master. So I can make a new feature on one branch, bug fix the master. Once the new feature is finished and tested, I can push it back into the master. You can list all the branches in a repo with git branch. By default, you'll just have master. It'll tell you which one you're in with the start. So I'm currently working in the master. Create a new branch, pretty simply, git branch. Branch names do not contain spaces. So uh, use dashes to separate words. Thanks, Linus. Git won't actually say anything again unless there's an error. So we've made git branch my awesome feature, or new awesome feature. We've got a branch, but it's not saying anything. Ooh, very tired now. Time for sleep yet? OK. Uh, there's a new branch there now, as you can see, when we do git branch. But we're not actually in it. We're still in the master. That's pretty important to remember. You don't automatically switch when you make a new branch. You can move between branches by checking out a different branch. Uh, git checkout works a bit differently to what checkout means in other version control systems. In this case, we're using checkout to move between two branches we have. So if we git checkout and provide a branch's name, we're now back in this branch. We can add commit and do everything else we might want to do. Uh, just like if we're on the master branch. Uh, if we get checkout to the master branch again, we'll switch back there. And it's all left pristine. The working directory does not follow the branch, so the working directory is the same thing between branches. When you're done with a branch, it's often a really good idea to merge it back in. Um, otherwise, you'll keep creating branches and it'll become completely unmanageable, and that's really silly. So git merge is the way you do that. I'm on the new awesome feature branch, and I've finished working on it. I'm ready to uh, put some stuff back in. Hang on. I'll now git merge the branch into the current one. So I'm going to git merge my awesome feature back into master. It's merged it. It's told me it's done. So you need to be in the branch you want to merge into. So I want to merge new awesome feature into master when you do the merge. Merging works by creating a new commit uh, that applies the total changes uh, from one branch to another. Uh, there's another way you can do with the same effect. That's called rebasing. This is even scarier. Uh, we don't really want to talk too much about this because it's bloody scary. But basically, it takes all the changes that were committed in one branch 
and kind of replays them back to another branch in sequence. So you end up with a bunch of commits that are kind of the same, but not. Um, I really don't want to talk about rebase because it's scary. But it is useful for cleaning up a bunch of commits before you push them. So say you've done a lot of really messy work, and because it's a good idea to commit, you've committed it along the way, and you want to push all that back to your main, your main branch, but you don't want them to have all the craft that developed as you're working on it. You can use rebase to clean that all up and sort of compact it down into one sort of package that gets delivered cleanly to the main branch. It's quite useful. In merging, we're creating a new commit and adding it to the branch that we're changing stuff, we're merging with. So, pretty simple. When you rebase, you take commits that are branch made and replay them onto the target branch. Um, it's quite easier to manage if you're doing active development on a lot of branches. Uh, you've got a development branch, a bug fix branch, a new feature branch, and so on, and you want to preserve the commit history uh, rather than filling your log with a bunch of merge, then rebase is the way to go. So that's basically what rebase does. Plugs it on. Can delete branches, pretty simple. Uh, you, don't, you can't delete a branch you're on, so you have to switch out of the branch if you want to delete it. Here we're removing some branches. It's gone. Forever. So everything so far, again, has basically been about a local Git repository with a little about remotes. But Git is a lot better uh, once you're collaborating with others over the internet. So we're going to talk about the remotes now. Git remote tells you what, what remotes the uh, repo has. So this is different from origin, as we discussed before, in that this is something you can push back to rather than just pull from. So here we're looking for git remotes, nothing there. We'll add a new remote, so it's git remote add. In this case, we're adding the origin in here, saying it's a um, GitHub repo, so this is something we can push to. There might be changes in this remote that you want to pull from, so you use git pull to get those. Git pull, grab all updated commits from the repo and merge them with your local repository. Uh, now that I've added the uh, remote, we'll ask get to get any commits we have. We're going to do remote add origin. Thank you. <laughs> Got excited there, did it? So we're adding a remote here, and then we're pulling the origin. So we've told this remote it's called origin, then we're pulling the origin's master branch. It's pretty simple. They'll get merged in. That's the syntax of that command. Fairly straightforward. All the latest changes are there. It's done the pull. You can push as well. Push works pretty similarly. Uh, if you have a remote, you can push code to it. Get push works pretty similarly. Again, thanks to John for this screenshot. Pretty simple. Sending code up. So before we start wrapping up, and I said this was a quick presentation, uh, the normal workflow for Git has some little tricks. Uh, the key workflow that you must remember when you're using Git is make changes to your working directory, stage those changes, and commit the stage. So there's multiple steps there that you may not be used to. Uh, it's a little different to subversion because your entire repo is remote in that case, where here you've got something you can mess around with locally. So you should feel a lot more freedom to commit things, make branches and roll back because none of it actually needs to live on the server unless you want it to. Uh, on a larger scale, you pull the existing changes, merge them with yours, and push changes back. It's pretty straightforward. So a common thing that can happen and how to use Git to fix it. Merge conflicts. Pretty messy, pretty scary sometimes. It's a merge that's going to go well. So this is not a merge conflict. Alice and Bob have made change to different parts of their files. So some changes. Some more changes. You fixed it now, Louis? Excellent. <laughs> Alice can merge Bob's changes without much problem here because they've changed different parts of the file. It's pretty simple. However, what if both Alice and Bob have modified the same parts of the file? And Alice wants to merge Bob's changes in and Git's, Git's not going to be the one that decides what's going on. It's not qualified to know your code. So it's going to spit something like this back at you. Fail. It's rejected. It doesn't know what's going on. Need you to fix the conflict before you can push. 
So to fix the conflict, you need to uh, pull the conflicting commits from the remote. So now you've pulled down the thing that was committing with the thing you were trying to push up. You got it there. We need to have a look at it. And it's going to fill it with these conflict markers. It's pretty similar to any other version control system. I'm sure you've seen it before. You can see that both versions of the file are present. You have to figure out which feature you actually want to keep. In this case, we're going to keep both features. This is one feature, this is another. As you can tell, these are features. Um, so in this case, we remove all the crap and tell, basically tell Git that we want the file to look like that. And then we commit it with a message if you want, and then push it, and there won't be a problem anymore. Very simple how you fix a merge conflict. Can be a pain in the ass if it happens with a lot of files, but something really useful is tagging releases. Um, you'll reach certain milestones in a project, like a beta or something like that, and you'll want to tag it. Uh, it's useful to be able to ask it to record those because you can jump back to them when you're bored, I guess. Tagging is how you do that. It's much the same as most other version control systems. Create a tag, call it something, in this case, V10. It's done. And push the tags up to the server so the server knows what's going on. You've got a new tag. Pretty cool thing about GitHub, if you're using GitHub, Bitbucket and all the others do this as well, though, is that tags are represented on the site. It's here. This is automatic. If you have a tag, it generates a zip of the source of that tag at that point in time. You don't have to do anything to get this. It's great. It's really useful. So use, use tags. It's a good way to mark things. You can also delete tags. It's gone. Pretty easy. Okay. That's pretty much everything. Um, some quick resources. This is the best place to learn Git ever. This is the official site. We've got a really great book. You should read it. It's probably the best, best thing ever. Second best thing ever. Talk about the best thing ever in a minute. Uh, GitHub has education accounts. Nobody seems to know this. If you go to this URL, every day or two they add more education accounts that are available. If you have an EDU AU account, so if you're a student or staff member, they'll give you a free account that has private repositories. So you can do your work in them. They're really useful. You get those for two years, they will renew them if you're still a student at the end of those two years though. So if you don't want to pay $8 a month or whatever it is for GitHub, get a free one. It's really useful. I actually write my PhD thesis in GitHub. <laughs> it's really good. Not kidding. You can, you can merge. I've got like a, a branch for people to read. I've got a branch for me to read and so on. It's actually really useful. GitHub for Mac is a really good way to use the very basics of Git. So if you're running a Mac, GitHub for Mac has merging, it has committing, it has pulling, it has pushing. If you're trying to do anything beyond that, it just shits itself. As long as you stick to the basics, though, it's fine. Or if you try and commit. Or if you try and, or if you try and commit in, in, if you're Winton. Or if you try and name anything. Or if you try and commit a message. Where's your commit? Thank you. If you're Winton, don't use GitHub for Mac. <laughs> and this is the best thing ever. So I lied before. This is the best thing ever. Try.github.com. It's an interactive website that lets you learn Git through GitHub. It basically lets you train yourself to do most of the commands I've covered here. It lets you break it spectacularly without actually working on your own code. So I really recommend going through this and spending some time learning Git. Do not assume you know Git if you just know how to push, pull, commit, and add, because you don't. It will break everything and kill all your loved ones if you don't develop a deep understanding of what's going on. It's thoroughly worth learning, but it can take a little bit of time. Stack Overflow is a good resource for Git. They haven't totally become overwhelmed with assholes in that department yet. Uh, Git's fantastic. I really encourage you all to learn it. You can... Check out some of our repos there. I'm not sure if we've updated anything recently. Though. There's probably some code there. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone have any questions, taunts? That would be awesome. Yes? I'd say that was the best uh, description of Git I've ever heard. Excellent. Um, Bitbucket also do free pirate repos for yes. teams. Yes, Bit Bitbucket's fantastic. For teams under five people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Git 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 Bitbucket is in every way as good as GitHub, except it hasn't got the community bit. Yeah. So if you're antisocial, use Bitbucket. That's basically it. You're not antisocial, Louis, but if you're antisocial, use Bitbucket. <laughs> um, what, Tim. Why did you use Git? Hmm? Well, why did you start? It's not SVN. Yeah, it's 
no, it's really powerful. I mean, it means you can actually mess around with things you should have been able to do all along in a really good open source version management system that's not crap. It's actually maintained. It's actually got a community around it. And it actually lets you do all these things without doing a head in. There's a few other things as well. Uh, at the time that we were waiting things. for version to get, um, we were working a lot in cafes with spotting internet access. And that meant that um, there was kind of this, uh, this disincentive to commit if you didn't have access to the net. And so because Git lets you uh, commit locally, we had a much uh, richer history of our, of our activity. And so when it came time to push, then it was available. In summary, you can commit on a plane. Without an internet connection. Yeah, it, it, it means you aren't attached to a potentially unreliable server. And yeah, yeah a lot more free. As long as you don't think it's a backup system, um, it's not a backup system. Do not treat Git like a backup system. Like for, say, a thesis. Like for, say, a thesis, yeah. <laughs> it's not a backup system, it's a revision control system. Thank you. Yes? I get told by a few people that uh, Xcode does something a bit funny for Git. Yeah. I, I would just not use Xcode's Git thing, unless you're Winton, because I think he uses that as well. Right. No, you don't use that? Yeah. yeah, just use the command line. Um, so, Git, sorry, uh, Xcode pretends that Git is like subversion yeah. and, and, and applies a number of metaphors that it uh, that doesn't support if you, or supersede. Yeah. But there's one thing that Xcode is really good at, and it's got an amazing uh, version comparator tool, where yeah. you can see two things side by side. But you don't lose that if you're just ignoring its functionality. So if, if you're comfortable with Git and actually know what you're doing, so if you've learned all the basics on try.github.com and so on, then feel free to use Xcode's Git support as long as you realize it's sort of got some weird metaphors as, as the way it displays the buttons, like commit doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It's, it's performing Git commands under there, by, but making it look like subversion. It's a bit weird. Anyone else, or should we just dance? Um, it's basically entirely around SSH keys, so public and private keys. You need to push a key to the server and then have that same key on the local machine. Uh, you can define different parts of the repo to be accessed by different people. Uh, that's beyond, way beyond the scope of this talk, but it, you can do it. Um, so if you want to sort of pigeonhole bits of the repo to different people, you can do that. And, and push, pull, and so on. Um, with the Git operation, if you have Yes. And you can tie yes. into specific parts of the repository? Yes. And it's probably a little bit more complex than it should be, but you can do it. The, the cleanest bit of Git is its front end, not its administrative enterprise side. But I'm sure that'll improve. It's, it's been sort of slowly getting a massive rewrite as well, which is good. It's not the most efficient thing in, in its internals. Dancing time? No? OK. If you use a GUI for Git, what would you use apart from the base run? There's one called Git Tower, I think. It's got like an air traffic control tower as its logo. That's probably the best one on Mac. The Atlassian one in the bit, bit bucket, or? Oh, Source Tree. Yeah, yeah, Source Tree's pretty good, but I haven't used it recently. Yeah, I'm sure they're all much the same these days. But again, I would recommend understanding the command line before you try and use the terminal, uh, the, the 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 GUI, because otherwise you'll just treat it like SVN and click the commit button and think it's doing something it's not. No. What's your recommendation for recovering a Git from if things do go bad? Panic. <laughs> we'll work at it slowly. Um, it's probably not all gone, as long as you haven't done something stupid, like reset it hard. And even, uh, then. And even then, you can get it back. Um, so I lied, but work, work, at it, work, work at it very slowly. And it, it's not a backup solution, so yeah, if you are working locally and have something for Time Machine, use the simple option first and get it back like that. Anyone else? Yes? What does the commit button in Xcode actually do? I'm not really sure. It seems to bundle up a few commands. It really looks like they've just taken the old SVN compatibility they had and then plugged Git into it instead. So I wouldn't necessarily trust it. Because as you said, well, I know when you branch, did they automatically switch to the Yeah, code? yeah. They're, they're, issuing they're issuing a few commands when they should branch. be doing one, yeah. It's totally fine if you know what it's doing, but again, don't trust it. The best bit of Xcode's Git functionality is it can create a Git project when you make a new project. From that, do it yourself. <laughs> Time for winter to dance. <laughs> <There we go. laughs>
Thank you.